This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Barnes, www.414.org.uk. Confessions by St. Augustine. Translated by Albert C. Outler. Book 4, Chapter 1 During this period of nine years, from my nineteenth year to my twenty-eighth, I went astray and led others astray. I was deceived and deceived others, in varied lustful projects, sometimes publicly by the teaching of what men style the liberal arts, sometimes secretly under the false guise of religion. In the one I was proud of myself, in the other, superstitious, in all, vain. In my public life I was striving after the emptiness of popular fame, going so far as to seek theatrical applause, entering poetic contests, striving for the straw garlands and the vanity of theatricals and intemperate desires. In my private life I was seeking to be purged from these corruptions of ours by carrying food to those who are called elect and holy, which in the laboratory of their stomachs they should make into angels and gods for us, and by them we might be set free. These projects I followed out and practised with my friends, who were both deceived with me and by me. Let the proud laugh at me, and those who have not yet been savingly cast down and stricken by thee, O my God. Nevertheless, I would confess to thee my shame, to thy glory. Bear with me, I beseech thee, and give me the grace to retrace in my present memory the devious ways of my past errors, and thus be able to offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving. For what am I to myself without thee but a guide to my own downfall? Or what am I, even at best, but one suckled on thy milk and feeding on thee, O food that never perishes? What indeed is any man? seeing that he is but a man. Therefore, let the strong and the mighty laugh at us, but let us who are poor and needy confess to thee. Chapter 2 During those years I taught the art of rhetoric. Conquered by the desire for gain, I offered for sale speaking skills with which to conquer others. And yet, O Lord, Thou knowest that I really preferred to have honest scholars, or what were esteemed as such, and, without tricks of speech, I taught these scholars the tricks of a guilty man. And thou, O God, did see me from afar, stumbling on that slippery path, and sending out some flashes of fidelity amid much smoke, guiding those who loved vanity and sought after lying, being myself their companion. In those years I had a mistress, to whom I was not joined in lawful marriage. She was a woman I had discovered in my wayward passion, void as it was of understanding, yet she was the only one, and I remained faithful to her, and with her I discovered by my own experience what a great difference there is between the restraint of the marriage bond contracted with a view to having children and the compact of a lustful love where children are born against the parents' will, although once they are born they compel our love. I remember, too, that when I decided to compete for a theatrical prize, some magician, I do not remember him now, asked me what I would give him to be certain to win. But I detested and abominated such filthy mysteries, and answered that even if the garland was of imperishable gold, I would still not permit a fly to be killed to win it for me. For he would have slain certain living creatures in his sacrifices, and by those honours would have invited the devils to help me. This evil thing I refused, but not out of a pure love of thee, O God of my heart, for I knew not how to love thee, because I knew not how to conceive of anything beyond corporeal splendours. And does not a soul, sighing after such idle fictions, commit fornication against thee, 
trust in false things, and feed on the winds? But still I would not have sacrifices offered to devils on my behalf, though I was myself still offering them sacrifices of a sort by my own superstition. For what else is it to feed on the winds, but to feed on the devils, that is, in our wanderings to become their sport and mockery? Chapter 3 And yet, without scruple, I consulted those other impostors whom they call astrologers, because they use no sacrifices and invoke the aid of no spirit for their divinations. Still, true Christian piety must necessarily reject and condemn their art. It is good to confess to thee and to say, Have mercy on me, heal my soul, for I have sinned against thee not to abuse thy goodness as a license to sin, but to remember the words of the Lord. Behold, you are made whole, sin no more, lest a worse thing befall you. All this wholesome advice labor to destroy when they say, The cause of your sin is inevitably fixed in the heavens, and this is the doing of Venus, or of Saturn, or of Mars. All this is in order that a man, who is only flesh and blood and proud corruption, may regard himself as blameless, while the creator and ordainer of heaven and the stars must bear the blame of our ills and misfortunes. But who is this creator but thou, our God, the sweetness and wellspring of righteousness, who renderest to every man according to his works, and despisest not a broken and a contrite heart? There was at that time a wise man, very skilful and quite famous in medicine. He was proconsul then, and with his own hand he placed on my distempered head the crown I had won in a rhetorical contest. He did not do this as a physician, however, and for this distemper only thou canst heal who resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. But didst thou fail me in that old man, or forbear from healing my soul? Actually, when I became better acquainted with him, I used to listen, rapt and eager to his words, for, though he spoke in a simple language, his conversation was replete with vivacity, life, and earnestness. He recognized from my own talk that I was given to books of the horoscope-casters, but he, in a kind and fatherly way, advised me to throw them away and not to spend idly on these vanities, care, and labor that might otherwise go into useful things. He said that he himself in his earlier years had studied the astrologer's art with a view to gaining his living by it as a profession. Since he had already understood Hippocrates, he was fully qualified to understand this too. Yet he had given it up and followed medicine, for the simple reason that he had discovered astrology to be utterly false, and as a man of honest character, he was unwilling to gain his living by beguiling people. But you, he said, have the profession of rhetoric to support yourself by, so that you are following this delusion in free will and not necessity. All the more, therefore, you ought to believe me, since I worked at it to learn the art perfectly because I wished to gain my living by it. When I asked him to account for the fact that many true things are foretold by astrology, he answered me, reasonably enough, that the force of chance, diffused through the whole order of nature, brought these things about. For when a man, by accident, opens the leaves of some poet who sang and intended something far different, a verse oftentimes turns out to be wondrously apposite to the reader's present business. It is not to be wondered at, he continued if out of the human mind, by some higher instinct which does not know what goes on within itself, an answer should be arrived at by chance and not art, which would fit both the business and the action of the inquirer. And thus truly, either by him or through him, thou wast looking after me, and thou didst fix all this in my memory, so that afterward I might search it out for myself. But at that time, neither the proconsul nor my dear Nebridius, a splendid youth and most circumspect, who scoffed at the whole business of divination, could persuade me to give it up, 
for the authority of the astrological authors influenced me more than they did. And thus far I had come upon no certain proof such as I sought, by which it could be shown without doubt that what had been truly foretold by those consulted came from accident or chance, and not from the art of the stargazers. Chapter 4 In those years, when I first began to teach rhetoric in my native town, I had gained a very dear friend, about my own age, who was associated with me in the same studies. Like myself, he was just rising up into the flower of youth. He had grown up with me from childhood, and we had both been schoolfellows and playmates. But he was not then my friend, nor indeed ever became my friend in the true sense of the term, for there is no true friendship save between those thou dost bind together and who cleave to thee by that love which is shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. Still, it was a sweet friendship, being ripened by the zeal of common studies. Moreover, I had turned him away from the true faith, which he had not soundly and thoroughly mastered as a youth, and turned him towards those superstitious and harmful fables which my mother mourned in me. With me this man went wandering off in error, and my soul could not exist without him. But behold, thou wast close behind thy fugitives, at once a god of vengeance and a fountain of mercies, who dost turn us to thyself by ways that make us marvel. Thus thou didst take that man out of this life when he had scarcely completed one whole year of friendship with me, sweeter to me than all the sweetness of my life thus far. Who can show forth all thy praise for that which he has experienced in himself alone? What was it that thou didst do to me at that time, O my God? How unsearchable are the depths of thy judgments! For when, sore sick of a fever, he long lay unconscious in a death sweat, and every one despaired of his recovery, he was baptized without his knowledge. And I myself cared little at the time, presuming that his soul would retain what it had taken from me, rather than what was done to his unconscious body. It turned out, however, far differently, for he was revived and restored. Immediately, as soon as I could talk to him, and I did this as soon as he was able, for I never left him, and we hung on each other over much, I tried to jest with him supposing that he also would jest in return about that baptism which he had received when his mind and senses were inactive, but which he had since learned that he had received. But he recoiled from me, as if I were his enemy, and with a remarkable and unexpected freedom he admonished me that if I desire to continue as his friend I must cease to say such things. Confounded and confused, I concealed my feelings till he should get well, and his health recover enough to allow me to deal with him as I wished. But he was snatched away from my madness, that with thee he might be preserved for my consolation. A few days after, during my absence, the fever returned, and he died. My heart was utterly darkened by this sorrow and everywhere I looked I saw death. My native place was a torture-room to me, and my father's house a strange unhappiness. And all the things I had done with him, now that he was gone, became a frightful torment. My eyes sought him everywhere, but they did not see him, and I hated all places because he was not in them because they could not say to me, Look, he is coming, as they did when he was alive and absent. I became a hard riddle to myself, and I asked my soul why she was so downcast, and why this disquieted me so sorely. But she did not know how to answer me, and if I said, Hope thou in God, she very properly disobeyed me because that dearest friend she had lost was an actual man, 
both truer and better than the imagined deity she was ordered to put her hope in. Nothing but tears were sweet to me, and they took my friend's place in my heart's desire. Chapter 5 But now, O Lord, these things are past, and time has healed my wound. Let me learn from thee, who art truth, and put the ear of my heart to thy mouth, that thou mayest tell me why weeping should be so sweet to the unhappy. Hast thou, though omnipresent, dismissed our miseries from thy concern? Thou abidest in thyself, while we are disquieted with trial after trial. Yet unless we wept in thy ears, would there be no hope for us remaining? How does it happen that such sweet fruit is plucked from the bitterness of life, from groans, tears, sighs, and lamentations? Is it the hope that thou wilt hear us that sweetens it? This is true in the case of prayer, for in a prayer there is a desire to approach thee. But is it also the case in grief for a lost love, and in the kind of sorrow that had then overwhelmed me? For I had neither a hope of his coming back to life, nor in all my tears did I seek this. I simply grieved and wept, for I was miserable and had lost my joy. Or is weeping a bitter thing that gives us pleasure because of our aversion to the things we once enjoyed, and this only as long as we loathe them? Chapter 6 But why do I speak of these things? Now is not the time to ask such questions, but rather to confess to thee. I was wretched, and every soul is wretched that is fettered in the friendship of mortal things. It is torn to pieces when it loses them, and then realizes the misery which it had even before it lost them. Thus it was at that time with me. I wept most bitterly, and found a rest in bitterness. I was wretched, and yet that wretched life I still held dearer than my friend. For though I would willingly have changed it, I was still more unwilling to lose it than to have lost him. Indeed, I doubt whether I was willing to lose it, even for him, as they tell unless it be fiction, of the friendship of Orestes and Pylades. They would have gladly died for one another, or both together, because not to love together was worse than death to them. But a strange kind of feeling had come over me, quite different from this, for now it was wearisome to live and a fearful thing to die. I suppose that the more I loved him, the more I hated and feared as the most cruel enemy that death which had robbed me of him. I even imagined that it would suddenly annihilate all men, since it had such a power over him. This is the way I remember it was with me. Look into my heart, O God. Behold, and look deep within me, for I remember it well, O my hope, who cleanses me from the uncleanness of such affections, directing my eyes toward thee, and plucking my feet out of the snare. And I marveled that other mortals went on living, since he whom I had loved, as if he would never die, was now dead. And I marveled all the more that I, who had been a second self to him, could go on living when he was dead. Someone spoke rightly of his friend as being his soul's other half, for I felt that my soul and his soul were but one soul in two bodies. Consequently, my life was now a horror to me, because I did not want to live as a half-self. But it may have been that I was afraid to die, lest he should then die wholly, whom I had so greatly loved. Chapter 7 O oh, madness, that knows not how to love men as they should be loved! O oh, foolish man that I was then, enduring with so much rebellion the lot of every man! Thus I fretted, 
sighed, wept, tormented myself, and took neither rest nor counsel, for I was dragging around my torn and bloody soul. It was impatient of my dragging it around, and yet I could not find a place to lay it down. Not in pleasant groves, nor in sport or song, nor in fragrant bowers, nor in magnificent banquetings, nor in the pleasures of the bed or the couch, not even in books or poetry did it find rest. All things looked gloomy, even the very light itself. Whatsoever was not what he was, was now repulsive and hateful, except my groans and tears, for in those alone I found a little rest. But when my soul left off weeping, a heavy burden of misery weighed me down. It should have been raised up to thee, O Lord, for thee to lighten and to lift. This I knew, but I was neither willing nor able to do, especially since, in my thoughts of thee, thou wast not thyself, but only an empty fantasm. Thus my error was my God. If I tried to cast off my burden on this fantasm, that it might find rest there, it sank through the vacuum and came rushing down again upon me. Thus I remained to myself an unhappy lodging where I could neither stay nor leave. For where could my heart fly from my heart? And where could I fly from my own self? Where would I not follow myself? And yet I did flee from my native place, so that my eyes would look for him less in a place where they were not accustomed to see him. Thus I left the town of Tagaste and returned to Carthage. Chapter 8 Time never lapses, nor does it glide at leisure through our sense perceptions. It does strange things in the mind. Lo, time came and went from day to day, and by coming and going it brought to my mind other ideas and remembrances, and little by little they patched me up again with earlier kinds of pleasure, and my sorrow yielded a bit to them. But yet there followed after this sorrow, not other sorrows just like it, but the causes of other sorrows. For why had that first sorrow so easily penetrated to the quick, except that I had poured out my soul onto the dust by loving a man as if he would never die, who nevertheless had to die? What revived and refreshed me more than anything else was the consolation of other friends, with whom I went on loving the things I loved, instead of thee. This was a monstrous fable, and a tedious lie, which was corrupting my soul with its itching ears by its adulterous rubbing. And that fable would not die to me, as often as one of my friends died. And there were other things in our companionship that took strong hold of my mind, to discourse and jest with him, to indulge in courteous exchanges, to read pleasant books together, to trifle together, to be earnest together, to differ at times without ill-humour as a man might do with himself, and even through these infrequent dissensions to find zest in our more frequent agreements, sometimes teaching, sometimes being taught, longing for someone absent with impatience and welcoming the homecomer with joy. These and similar tokens of friendship, which spring spontaneously from the heart of those who love and are loved in return, in countenance, tongue, eyes, and a thousand ingratiating gestures, were all so much fuel to melt our souls together, and out of the many made us one. Chapter 9 This is what we love in our friends, and we love it so much that a man's conscience accuses itself if he does not love one who loves him, or respond in love to love seeking nothing from the other but the evidences of his love. This is the source of our moaning when one dies, the gloom of sorrow, the steeping of the heart in tears, all sweetness turned to bitterness, and the feeding of death in the living, because of the loss of the life of the dying. Blessed is he who loves thee, and who loves his friend in thee, and his enemy also for thy sake, for he alone loses none dear to him, if all are dear in him 
who cannot be lost. For who is this but our God, the God that created heaven and earth, and filled them because he created them by filling them up? None loses thee but he who leaves thee, and he who leaves thee, where does he go? Or where can he flee but from thee well pleased, to thee offended? For where does he not find thy law fulfilled in his own punishment? Thy law is the truth, and thou art truth. <laughs>